with that, we're going to, um, Terry and I, um, and mainly Terry, um, is going, are going to you know, do our first attempt at uh, summarizing uh, the output from the last two days. Great. Thank you. And yeah, and just to reiterate in terms of the, of the posting, uh, we're assuming that it's okay to post them. We're not going to check with each of you and make you come back and, you know, uh, you know uh, agree. Um, so, uh, so if there's a problem, you know, speak, speak now or forever. Hold. All right. Uh, so the question sort of came up at the beginning, you know, why are we here and what are we trying to do? And so I think hopefully we can all agree that, uh, that if we're successful at what we've been discussing for the past day and a half, that we could come up with a global platform for translational research. And then translation has many forms. It could be um, from a, the cohort to the bedside, from the cohort back to the bench, from the bedside to the population, informing the biologic and genetic basis for disease and the impact on clinical care and population health. So that's what we thought we were doing. Does anybody think we were doing something different from that? The wording here may not be the most pristine, and we can, we can fiddle with it a bit. If you have suggestions, I think one of the things we'll, we'll likely do is ask for people to make suggestions on the, you know, if, if there's like wording that really bothers you. Um, but just wordsmithing, I think we won't quite worry about, so. Okay, so that's what we're all trying to do. Um, so what we've done is, is basically frame these around the, the breakout group topics. The breakout group topics not, you know, um, um, uh, coincidentally, were chosen because they seem to be the areas that we both uh, most needed to focus on. But what Jeff and I have tried to do is to integrate our notes from the two days of, of discussions as well as from the breakout. So, so there's a little bit of uh, uh, these things in both. And also, we've, we've moved some of the breakout recommendations to two slides at the end, uh, one of which kind of encompasses the, the key scientific opportunities and another kind of the key funding needs. So if you don't see them on here, don't panic. Um, hopefully they're coming up later. Uh, but we did hear from group number one uh, that a, a tiered approach uh, seemed to make the most sense to them. It certainly made sense to us, uh, starting with cohort level meta metadata and then really, you know, kind of working toward individual level data. Um, we heard about uh, a couple of different platforms that could be leveraged for this, so we don't have to build something anew. We could use and we could decide which are the, are the best or adapt them. Uh, the NCI cohort consortium was mentioned, as was the UK Dementia platform. There there are probably others, and to the degree that we can find uh, those and, and uh, uh, e examine them for how useful they would be with, without obsessing over it, but, but picking one. And then the tiered structure that they suggested uh, seemed, seemed to make a lot of sense. With, did anyone want to uh, modify what's up here, or uh, are there any changes to it, things that you thought about as you heard uh, the other groups discussing? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. clear whether this was intended to be basically an information source or an actual database where one could pose a query and do research. So what's, what's which, contemplated which here? Is it? Yeah. yeah, I think we, we split up these two areas because the next group then got more into the database queryable, that, that sort of thing. And, uh, and as this was presented, Daniel said, we really need to merge with, with group two. Um, so I think we're looking at kind of both of those. Is that, is that right, Daniel? than being able to drill down in it. It should be queryable. It would still be a queryable database of information about the cohorts. But in terms of then being able to, to run analyses, we saw that as falling primarily in the province of other groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, when we get to the concept of the reproducibility network, it's clearly Im implied that you have to be able to search for the cohorts <laughs> that would allow for that reproducibility. So, so that, that's a functionality that we think is uh, a significant priority. Great. Yeah, and there it is. There it is. There. So, uh, recognizing that there's funding and infrastructure needing to needed to field these queries and even to fill out uh, the information on the forms, and that we should, you know, build on information that is already available in various resources, such as the little book that we put together. But there are others as, as well. Um, suggestion that there there could be companies that would have solutions to, to this kind of thing that deal with these these kinds of questions for their particular particular areas. Um, but I think some agreement that they should not hold the data. They should just help us, uh, if they're willing, to, uh, to, to make it in a queryable form. Is that a fair summary? Of that? 
Okay, great. Um, an interesting project that came up that could be facilitated would be building a reproducibility network, which I just thought was a cool idea, and so I put it in blue and blue bold italic type. Um, and particularly as we're pressed more and more to, uh, to demonstrate the reproducibility of scientific findings, uh, this would be a great resource for doing that. We do need to address data security with cloud solutions and also the various regulatory um, um, prescriptions on, on using data in the cloud and also using data that you derive from data in a, in a specific country. Um, I'm just reiterating these, these issues. I'm not, you know, proposing that we try to solve them today, but I'm hoping that when, you know, going forward from this, these would be issues that, uh, that a group that was um, sort of commissioned to address these things would, would actually address. Um, we also uh, heard that we needed to create scalable and transportable systems for extracting follow-up uh, information and outcomes, and we talked about doing that from electronic medical records. And there was a suggestion for developing a repository of standard operating procedures, for example, collection and storage, for example, assays and protocols, assessing validity and quality, that, all that sort of stuff. Any disagreement with, uh, with what's up here or anything to add? Okay. I think your fourth bullet there came up several times here in terms of the need to understand country-specific regulations. Yeah. Seems like there's a big chunk of work that needs to get done there in terms of the legal stri stri strictures that may get in the way of even well-intentioned efforts uh, to try to do more sharing. So I just would not want that to get considered as an easy one. I think that's right. actually going to take a fair amount of energy. Well, and not only that, but the, the coming uh, uh, European regulations are, are of great concern to, to everyone, um, and, and that's, you know, bigger than a lot of us to be able to deal with. I, I assume that there are some discussions going on at the at higher levels to, to address that. Do you, so you're nodding. But, yeah, the HEROES is, is, is uh, and, and I think other groups as well. David. So I don't see Rory here, but I, I've sort of been curious how the UKB can be so almost laissez-faire at distributing data around the world. And the answer is that it isn't managed by a university, by a institution, by a government. It's managed by a not-for-profit, which has a limited capital, and thus doesn't have an army of lawyers. Um, I know people will be nervous, you can imagine it. Uh, let's say NIH is managing this. Well, then are all the data available through freedom of information requests, et cetera? So how about setting up a not-for-profit to manage this, obviously funded by the funders, mm -hmm. but uh, that may provide a much, much, much more flexible framework, uh, like the yeah. um, genomic mm -hmm. trust and things. No, that's, that's a, an excellent idea. I think the, the NIH probably wouldn't be in a position to, to do this, and, and for many reasons, you know, it, it wouldn't be the best place to do it. There, there is a not-for-profit in, in the uh, Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, the G2MC, the GA4GH is another possibility. I mean, there are, there are, are other options, so I agree that would, that would work. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, moving on then to group, you know, one and a half, uh, as, it, as it were, if we, if we meld the two of them on IT considerations. Um, the, the key point to, uh, needing to define what cohorts we actually want to in include in this. I mean, we had four criteria that we then relaxed to, to bring other groups in, um, but uh, what, what you want to do in terms of, of defining the cohorts to include and what data will be stored and, and used. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about federation versus centralization or federation and centralization, uh, the pros and cons of each. I wasn't sure, and uh, Thomas and, and um, um, Joyce, no, Joyce was your group, Thomas and and uh, Teresa. Teresa, yes, that's right, I'm sorry, um, uh, in, in terms of where you settled. I mean, it, it seemed as though centralized might be a, a great approach for the places where you can do it, and then you do federated for those that you can't, or did you decide one way or the other? Yeah, I think that's kind of the point. I mean, federated where you, where you just can't share data or the size is too large, but maybe, you know, it, mm -hmm. I guess the example is in the research kind of cohort environment. I mean, there is central, some centralization through some of the traditional control access databases, but, but federation is going to become a reality where you just can't share the data and we have to, you know, we have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So is there any advantage to having some, you know, some centralized, I mean, if some are federated, should all of them be federated and we just have a central coordinating function or that can be something to be explored, uh, perhaps? Yeah, I think, I mean, the thing about the federate, fully federated model is that each individual cohort requires, needs to dedicate some FTE or something to actually maintain yeah. their, their presence in this network, which may not be sustainable for smaller cohorts. So 
you know, there is some centralization probably required for the smaller cohorts so they can actually get their, uh, I guess, their critical mass uh, you know, to, 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 to fund their kind of efforts to, uh, to mm -hmm. evolve. Okay, great. Um, there was also the, the point made that, made that standard interfaces are needed, um, and there are some existing examples to use for that. Uh, there are also a number of GA4GH work streams that, that are directly related to this that we would be silly not to build on. And, and you know, the, the fact that G2MC and GA4GH have worked together well and can, will continue to do so, I think, will, will help facilitate that. Um, the idea of uh, what we used to call a frequent flyer or a, or a black diamond, you know, <laughs> player that uh, that basically once you're once you're fully authorized, you can get expedited access to lots and lots, if not all, of the data sets uh, is something that we've had challenges in, um, um, uh, implementing in the U.S., but hopefully, in uh, something like this, would be a little bit easier. And then maybe operationalizing the consent um, to harmonize and standardize consent, ensure that access is compatible with consent. Are there ways to sort of, you know? NLP or natural language processing the, the consents uh, rather than everyone having to review every consent form and figure out can I use it for this or, or can't I? Can I make one comment? Please. I just wanted to go back to the first bullet and uh, maybe see if there's any reaction but as, uh, as you know we, we somewhat arbitrarily defined 100,000 as the, as, the, as the floor for participation in this meeting but it's clear that there are some incredibly valuable cohorts that have fewer in number, and also that we may be excluding regions of the world who simply cannot afford um, to put cohorts of that size together. Uh, so that's a, an issue that we need to grapple with going forward. I'm not sure if anybody wants to make a comment on that, but I, I, I just wanted to highlight that, that important issue. Collected very valuable concentrations of, of specific diseases around the globe. Mm -hmm. it could could be very valuable at much smaller numbers than. And and you'll recall that that one of our criteria was not to be disease specific, um, and maybe that's something that was for this meeting. Maybe that's something that we want to set aside and and include disease specific cohorts to the degree that they're they're willing to participate. I think that's a really important issue. I don't want to gloss over it too quickly here, because. Uh, this consortium will succeed if it maintains focus and if it tries to become the consortium of all cohorts for all diseases, rare, common, and everything else, it's gonna drown or, or fall underneath its own weight. Uh, there is, I know a model we've been talking about a little bit because this comes up a lot <laughs> in the All of Us program is that disease-specific cohorts could benefit from a lot of the infrastructure and the discussion about policies and all the rest that have to be dealt with uh, in cohorts that are not focused on specific illnesses. So maybe there's sort of a franchise model that could be thought about, but I would just like to really argue against the idea that we'll just try to sweep all disease-specific cohorts into this. Uh, it, it's gonna be too much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, you gotta have some idea here that these have gotta be big. Mm -hmm. I take your point that if you have a really exceptionally valuable cohort uh, in a population that you want to have included that realistically can't make it to 100,000 but could make it to 50, the idea of pushing that one aside doesn't make a lot of sense. But on the other hand, if it's 300, it's probably sure. not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So is there anyone who would then would argue with, with really having 100,000 be our lower limit unless there's a really good reason to go below that? Yes, right. Val? Yes, uh, unless there's a good reason, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so Val was just saying that the reason would be to, to have it be in a, a lower resourced setting rather than just a, a smaller cohort in a well resourced setting or one that's already well represented. Paul, or, did you have a? Could also be a population where simply you can't find 100,000 participants because there aren't that many, but it's a very special population. Well, take Native Americans, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, Paul, and I think, was there another one over? Mm -hmm. 
Well, and the, the affiliate model is an, is an interesting one. So, so we could have groups that are affiliated but necessar not necessarily having their data in the, in the database, but they could still you know, access easily and certainly use all of the tools and that, that kind of thing. So that's something to think about. So. Jeremy, did you want to? No? No, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, and I think the other, uh, other points have been made. Um, on the, uh, the second sort of half of things that they, uh, they discuss, uh, discuss, discoverability, um, having searchable databases. Again, GA4GH is working in this area. I liked the idea of a data use ontology. Um, I thought that was a, a really neat uh, suggestion. We don't really have an ontology of, of standard terms, to my knowledge, um, of how data can be used. And, and using that as a way to tag data uh, sets with use restrictions would certainly make the lives of data access committees um, easier and, and hopefully of, uh, of this uh, consortium as well. Uh, recognizing the spe specifying hypotheses is not always possible. We do need to do some uh, education of, of IRBs and other, other groups that uh, hypothesis-free research, I think, has proven its value uh, over time um, very, very eff effectively, uh, and that, uh, that we need to try to get them away from insisting on having a specific hypothesis. Uh, we heard about the challenge of legacy data, the importance of measuring impact, and, um, and also the, the potential to negotiate with cloud vendors to try to get uh, just as we might get with uh, large-scale open data to get a, a large-scale uh, cloud vendor to, to work with us. Uh, this was the only group to my recollection, I guess group five did a little bit, um, that prioritized, uh, and, uh, and they said their highest priority was to work with uh, group one first to get an accurate registry so that then you know what your universe is that you're, you're working with, and then after that to select data standards. Any changes or modifications to this? Uh, yes, Peter. <laughs> Just to say that, the data use ontology is one of the key deliverables from our date <laughs> jury work I'm group, sorry. so data use and research identity. So both the, the library card concept and the data use ontology, are, we, we're on it. I, I think oh, this great. is a huge opportunity to, to find new use cases for that work. Fabulous. Yeah, my, my apologies. I'm not, I'm not as familiar with what you guys are doing as I will be, I can tell. <laughs> so. All right. Um, in terms of the scientific agenda, uh, we heard a lot of suggestions for enhancement, enhancements to in existing cohorts, um, particularly collecting samples in cohorts that had not collected them previously, so that would require funding. Uh, collecting new samples for repeated measures, either from baseline, uh, repeating measures from baseline, or in a time-dependent way, uh, looking over, uh, over subsequent follow-up. Or for novel assays that need to have uh, the, the samples collected in a specific way, we heard about transcriptomics in the challenges of doing that. Um, development of po population-specific genotyping arrays or arrays that could be used in a much wider range of populations than we currently have by adding in population-specific variants that are not otherwise represented. Um, standardizing uh, 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 novel assay types, and we didn't talk much about uh, what assays you know, should be um, uh, standard or standardized or used, and so we'll have to prioritize and choose among those. Uh, the support for cohort-wide genotyping and other uh, uh, assays, whether omic or, or otherwise. So there was a very strong uh, argument in, in support of doing things cohort-wide. When I was in the cohort business, we heard a lot about, oh my goodness, why would we want to measure, you know, 500 or 4,900 normal X's to find, you know, the, the, um, uh, one, you know, the 100 or so that are, are abnormal. Yes, you want the 100 or so that are abnormal, but the, the 4,900 might be um, considered to be a, not, not a good use of, of specimens. Think about uh, pro, um, prostate-specific antigen in, in, in women, for example. You wouldn't do that unless it's part of a, you know, an, an assay platform where everybody gets the same thing, and of course that's where the cost goes down. So I know there are strong advocates for this approach on this side of the room. Uh, that side of the room has been a little bit more quiet. Uh, is there anyone who, who could see a, a difficulty with trying to go forward with um, cohort-wide assays? Oh, Paul. Pardon me? Aside from, uh, you know, if money were no object, which it always is. So, Paul? Paul, use the microphone, please. I mean, we have a lot with the early markers for cancer, and it's very, very specific to prediction or early detection of specific cancers. So, and we do that on, you know, two or three percent of the cohort, you know, three to one, four to one case control ratio. So to do that on, and a lot of them don't even pan out, but to do that on 100% seems like yeah, it'd be very wasteful. So it seems like you'd, you'd want to have a hybrid where 
you know, like a GWAS or something, maybe do it on everybody, but specific markers that are very disease specific, and that's the case control approach. So, uh, Rory, did you want to comment on that? Or maybe Gaddy first. Uh, it might, there might simply be areas of the world where a certain array <coughs> would be more proper than in others. <coughs> like if we talk about the, the Jewish or the Ashkenazi Jewish mm -hmm. array, there's an 850K array that covers all the issues ever reported, etc. Mm -hmm. So it would be... Uh, <coughs> would be smart to use such an array for that population. Or to take the, that part right. of that array that is the unique, that it, yes, and, and stick right. it on a, a larger array. Yeah. But not to ignore. Yes, oh, exactly. Yes, Rory. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry if it wasn't implicit, uh, explicit, but it was implicit that one wouldn't do all assays on okay. all people, mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, uh, as well as the value of doing genotyping <coughs> on a whole cohort um, with some of these novel arrays that give you thousands of metabolites or thousands of proteins um, for the kinds of hypothesis-free analyses that you're talking about, um, uh, there might be value in doing those uh, <coughs> on the whole cohort. Right. Uh, but that's not to argue that one does everything on everybody. Okay, great. No, thanks for making that clear. Good. Uh, and then uh, we, we also heard about standardized phenotyping approaches, especially with electronic health records and the, the potential for a pilot study, which will come up in the, uh, um, in the summary of the scientific opportunities. Uh, novel environmental measures we've, we've been trying to get at for years and years, if not decades and decades. Um, and it sounded like Yes, we have hopes that there are new technologies that will help with this, but the, the main thing, I think, would be to prioritize um, you know, what, what are the things that are the most important that are feasible, and then to come up with some criteria as to how to choose those. So you know, having to do not only with cost, but, but also with the accuracy of the data, uh, the burden on the participant, all the things that we, we recognize in cohort studies. And there was also a, a fair amount of discussion about um, uh, data visualization methods and ways of, of converting um, uh, the data into approaches that, that can actually be understood by, uh, by a human being. Often those involve patterns because we're very good at patterns, um, but uh, um, developing those kinds of methods would be, would be wonderful to have happen. Any revisions to this? Not, all right. Great. And then on scientific questions, um, there, there have been some good examples in the past of things that have been done across cohorts. The, the uh, Cancer con uh, Consortia have done this very, very, very well, as well as Cardiovascular Consortia. They almost always require close collaboration rather than just taking the data and using them without, uh, without interaction, and obviously independent support. Um, we heard determinants of health uh, would, would be a useful thing for very large cohorts to pursue. That, you know, means that you've defined health, and that can be a difficult thing when you have basically an event-based medical record where you find out when people have something bad, but you don't find out when they have something good. Um, rare conditions or subgroups, obviously, would be uh, very um, uh, uh, tractable with large cohorts, like in the millions of people. Um, and recognizing that we should harmonize and standardize only the things that really matter, um, not trying to standardize everything. Uh, and that, that is, there is a tendency, I think, to try to, to you know, boil the ocean on, on these, where we really just focus on those that are important. Um, developing system, systems for long-term, for following long-term health out, outcomes in, this is my abbreviation for low and middle income countries for under-resourced settings, es essentially. Um, and that those, those systems will need to be developed and translated, and, and that's not an, an inexpensive effort, and probably not one that is easily supported by countries that are not working in, in, that, in those areas. So, um, and then facilitate research access to health outcome data and, uh, and recognizing the data protections. Um, I thought the point, the interesting point was made about engaging, uh, engage, this would be engaging of funders um, with governments to convince them of the relevance of, uh, of research to clinical care. Um, and I know that the, that's done a lot in some countries and may not be done quite so much in, in others. We heard the example of the, the Mexico City cohort where an observation was made that had a, a direct impact um, on, on healthcare policy. So those kinds of things would be useful. Comments on this? I can see I'm exhausting you. Yes, Richard. 
you know, when you say develop systems for long-term health outcomes in low- and middle-income countries, I think what you'd have to do if you're working in India, if you're working in Africa, you'd have to work in areas where for some special reason it happens to be possible to, you know, to be able to follow things up. There'd be some special region of India, you know, Bashi or somewhere like that. There'd have to be some special regions in Africa, for example, those already covered by the in-depth network. But it's taken decades to get the in-depth network to work. You can't just suddenly say, we're going to, you know, we're going to now be able to assess health outcomes throughout some particular region when there's just no medical structure there at all. Mm -hmm. It you takes ages to get disease registries that work or d and then just work in areas where for some reason it is practicable to follow what, follow up what happens. Mm -hmm. Do you think there might come a day when, when our cell phones um, might be able to provide this kind of information for us? I mean, Jeff gave us a picture of a, a, you know, someone who obviously didn't have a lot of other technology, but, uh, but had, yeah. his, had a cell phone. That might very well be, yes. Mm -hmm. It might well be that some things like that would be possible. Mm -hmm. I'd really like sort of cell phone-based follow-up in clinical trials as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, was, when he was try doing Aquamat, I was trying to get him to make it four times bigger and just get people to say whether they were dead or alive by their cell phones. Mm -hmm. Great. Other, yeah, other, uh, other <laughs> comments? Did you have a comment, Cam Camilla? Just a minor thing. I, I was going to say, in, in the last sentence, relevance of research to the health system, not oh, okay. only health care. Good point. Because it, it just covers public health. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's delete? Oh, no. Oh, there it is. No, that's not it. So... Oh, I see it. Forgive me, I'm struggling with a new system, a new computer. So, all right. Yes, it happens. It's like, where's the delete key? Okay, great. Walt has a oh, Walt? Yes, please. One comment. Uh, basically, it relates to the first point about uh, 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 good examples in the past almost always required close collaboration. It was really, I think, the point that Richard emphasized in his comments uh, uh, earlier this morning. Uh, yeah, uh, and we do have good examples there, but it would all, uh, getting funding support to do that has been a, a challenge. And actually, quite modest amounts can leverage really, uh, I think, billions of dollars of investment in, in the cohorts. So having a mechanism for uh, modest funding of collaborative analyses uh, would be extraordinarily helpful. Good point. So let me, if I can... You want to say something while I'm typing? Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Um, I'm just going to save because it's always wise to save. I'm not going to save. Oh, come on. There we go. All right. Moving on. We're, we're halfway through. The policy agenda, uh, we heard a number of challenging challenges, the, uh, the f defining the what's in it or, you know, what's the, what's the payback, what's the incentive um, for lots of different stakeholders in this, the investigators, the participants, the countries, the, you know, lots of, lots of different groups. Um, so really trying to, to figure out what will engage and what will also threaten various stakeholders in, in designing a policy. Um, differing institutional interpretations of regulations, we certainly have that in the U.S., uh, just interpreting the HIPAA rule. My goodness, there are, you know, probably as many different interpretations as there are institutions. Um, sharing samples uh, is obviously more difficult than sharing data and metadata, which are the strong arguments for um, uh, converting the samples into data rather than trying to share samples. Um, there are, as we heard earlier, differing uh, approved uses by cohorts, and so the, the effort for, uh, that uh, GA4GH is undertaking for the data use ontology would be very helpful there, uh, including native and aboriginal communities are, are particularly, is particularly challenging because of the social pressures they've been under as well as their typically small size and something that uh, needs to be recognized. And then uh, the challenge of, uh, challenges of including uh, for-profit entities, recognizing that they can be uh, tremendously valuable as well. They also identified a number of needs and benefits. Um, uh, the, the first was to combine this, the scientific and the policy discussions, although I noted that the, and Laura had to, had to leave, but you know, the IT people weren't complaining about being separated from the, the, uh, the scientific goals people and the, and the omics people didn't complain about that. But the, the policy people often are shunted off to the side and this is something we need to be sure doesn't continue um, because they can only develop policy as it's informed by what it is we want to do. You have to develop it in, in that way. Um, 
So defining what the collaboration is trying to do, some high-level principles, which we'll get into, uh, develop and adopt uh, international principles if we can for those who would, would be um, uh, collaborating in our, in our uh, cohort consortium and building on, on the framework that the GA4GH has developed as well as other groups. Uh, developing some kind of a protocol for review of the project, not only for uh, selection to come into the, the um, uh, program or the, the collaboration, but also for each cohort to decide project by project, whether they want to participate in that or not. And many cohort studies have ancillary study policies where they want to be sure there's something relevant to their, you know, their goals, doesn't use up too much of their samples or time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, uh, having some kind of a resource or platform for sharing lessons learned from the, the collaborations that have already been very successful. Any revisions to this? Camilla, did you? Oh, I'm sorry, Richard. Um, sort of comment again, it's uh, defining what's in it for investigators, cohorts, countries. Um, you know, you take something like the Worldwide Antimalarial Resistance Network, you know, they've had to push so hard to try to include the people who are getting these malaria specimens from the field actually involved rather than just get the specimens and send them to some central lab that then analyzes, sequence everything and publishes the results in nature. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how... I mean, I'd like to just get the two words, data sharing and data taking, put in your list somehow. There is okay. a difference between data sharing and data taking. Mm -hmm. I've spent decades of my life trying to encourage data sharing. And, and for certain things, I think data taking is fine. And I think some of these genetic things, that, you know, the, where, where it's sort of simple. But I think for, certainly for behavioral things, and actually for some of the metabolic things, I think there's going to be, have to be a lot more care going into trying to work out what's valid and what isn't, mm -hmm. making sure that you've done re-surveys that assess the reproducibility of a particular biochemical measurement when the same individual is measured five years apart. You know, you, it, there's somehow it isn't, it isn't as simple as just reading a letter off a Gattaca. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I'd, I'd like actually the words data sharing and data taking to be contrasted. Is, is there a contrast? Put a question like, mm -hmm. if you like. Is there a conflict between data sharing and data taking? Mm. I'd like that question to be put in there because I think there is, and I think we aren't taking okay. it seriously enough. Do, do you think if we say distinguish data sharing and data taking? But, well, I but don't mind exactly how you phrase it, but, but there is a distinction yeah. there. And, and, and trying think, to emphasize you know, the former. And, and we, we've done a lot of prospective studies in middle income countries, actually, mostly rather than low, but some low income countries. And you've got to try to make sure that what comes out really Makes reflects sense. the people who've actually, you know, put a huge amount of their lives into actually making the thing work there. Mm -hmm. And just putting it up so that whoever's got the fastest computer can use it isn't fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we patent all kinds of Mickey Mouse things in the US patent courts, and then you want to try and take away things that have involved huge amounts of work. And it's, it, there is a distinction between data sharing and data taking, mm -hmm. and we aren't making it. And I think for some things, you know, where you've got masses and masses of, you know, digital data that just, you know, you couldn't possibly, no investigator could manage on their own. It just then basically, yeah, let, get everybody looking at it, get everybody involved. It's the only way you're actually going to make a, a tenth of the use that could be made of it. Mm -hmm. That's what the astronomy community does. Mm -hmm. But I think there are other things where I think you've got to be much more careful to involve the people who've, spent decades maybe mm -hmm. creating these studies in okay. sometimes in very difficult circumstances. Great. No, I, th I will try to capture that for sure. So we have Camilla and then Gaddy. Camilla? Yeah. I oh, just I'm wanted sorry, to follow up on the, the, the title of this is a policy agenda, and I think uh, John Dinesh's point should be brought <coughs> into it. Is this collaboration, or should it be formed to respond to a need for a sort of platform for collaborations, or to respond to grand challenges or missions, if you want. Uh, and um, as uh, John said, they were inclined towards the latter, latter, and so am I. I think it's very hard to do this kind of job uh, unless there's some clear meaning uh, why we should do it. So, so do you think we're not capturing We're not that really addressing that in, in the, that list. In this, I see. So you were just suggesting that we add grand challenges as, as one of the ways to em 
kind of yes, elevate and, this. And then the, there could be a discussion about whether that should be some specific ones to start with, or mm -hmm. uh, we haven't really discussed any of that, but it was raised, and I think it's a very good point. So, so I, I mistakenly put it under in John's session. So you can so put it wherever yeah, you okay, want. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe we can we'll hold that point for the moment and and come back to it. Which actually leads me to my question about: Do we want under policy to also suggest a prioritization? Say. We're talking about all these uh, special communities that naturally have the least chance to be included in the cohorts. And if they are in the courts, the least chance to be annotated. And does a body like the coordinating body of this effort want to suggest that if there is funding, if somebody is looking for priority for funding <laughs> or for research, one might want to do it in the places where it's most needed and least available, both you know, materials and cohorts. So I, I guess I'm, I'm no, we're, losing we're, we you. No, we were exposed in our session mm -hmm. to, to the people from Malaysia right. who have a cohort that includes a variety of interesting mm -hmm. subpopulations but has never been fully uh, biologically annotated and will probably, in parentheses, never be so unless there is a priority mm -hmm. given or suggested. So if you have the money, you can give, you can prioritize. But if you don't have the money, you're just a, you know, a policy, a, 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 a <laughs> you know, a way shower, mm -hmm. then you can show away and say, well, this should be prioritized, this should be. Yeah, um, so I think that would be one of the international principles that we want to, we want to, is that, is that reasonable? I'm, I just realized it's 1.53, it's my how time flies. Um, so, so we may want to go on, uh, Arthur, quickly. Yeah, j just a quick comment, I think, the including for-profit entities, it strikes me that pharmaceutical companies and life sciences companies have a lot of common needs and interest in this in this scenario. And it may be that it's better to talk about how you best incorporate them in and when versus whether the concept yeah. of a for-profit entity involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might be a more constructive way. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. to What's to the framework that? for engagement? Yeah, because you know, the reality is, is many of these national biobanks the politicians and their constituencies are looking for new commercial enterprises to be spun off of these or commercial collaborations mm -hmm. that help develop new treatments. So there's quite a bit of sensitivity out there, particularly outside of the U.S. on this point. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. I just, I realized we need to move a little bit faster. So, um, so the, um, there were, it was a description of some pilot efforts from that group um, coming up with a governance description. Uh, again, in framing that in terms of what it is we want to, this thing to do. Um, some traits of the, of the cohort policies, like the samples can't leave the country or whatever they might be. Uh, have that added to the metadata. And then identifying some current collaborations, and particularly what's worked and what hasn't, because there have been some very effective collaborations uh, already. Um, understanding the implications of the, um, the uh, new privacy regulations and in engaging the primary funders um, for, you know, sort of recognizing that, that this is, uh, there's shared benefit and power to the investment that they made if they will uh, uh, facilitate um, uh, additional research to be done in these potential areas for common consent. Uh, you can read these as, as easily as, as I uh, can. Um, but, but again, uh, focusing on some of the work that's already been done rather than, than reinventing the wheel here would be important. And then the suggestion from Philippe about developing an international uh, strategic agenda for coordinating these kinds of, of cohorts. So, so what, are, what is it that we're trying to get at by doing this coordination? Any quick comments on this one? I know I'm inhibiting you, I'm sorry. 
All right. Um, and then uh, moving on to the sort of the assays that could be done, um, John's group was very, and, and Halkin were very good at, at identifying key questions that could only be addressed through large-scale collaborations. We heard about uh, genomic and exposure diversity, but I think you guys were the first to mention migrant studies, or one of the few to mention it, so, so an interesting approach. Um, rare diseases and, and rare, rare humans, uh, drug repurposing opportunities, maybe some global problems that require lots of differences in levels of various exposures, such as obesity alcohol-related diseases, et cetera, the potential for microbiome studies across ethnicities and exposures, not simple to do, but, uh, but still feasible, and recognizing that if we do very, very large projects, it will help to drive down costs for everyone, uh, and a, a central coordinating function could uh, enable queries that basically wouldn't it be nice if you could just identify the most informative cohorts for a particular study you wanted to do and then engage those. Uh, I didn't give you a chance, so, so John and, and Halcon. Or, or others? Is this cool the way it is? And again, you'll get a chance to look at these. Uh, how can? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think this looks, looks oh, good. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Great. Um, and then we heard from them the types of data of most value. Uh, people are not excited uh, much about exome sequencing. Everybody's excited about genome sequencing today. Who knows what it'll be tomorrow, but uh, the genome has obvious advantages. Um, but also leveraging existing GWAS data and uh, SNP array genotyping. I, I liked the figure of 50 to 100 million dollars. I wasn't sure where that came from, so we can, we can uh, pin you down as to Yes, yeah, that's right. That's where most of mine come from. Um, so, and then uh, um, there, we would need some cohort-specific sequencing, how many people, uh, you know, a few hundred to a thousand perhaps, to identify the, the low frequency, not the truly rare, but the low frequency variants in uh, um, uh, uh, more isolated populations. And obviously, again, under resource settings, need funding to be able to do this to level the playing field. Um, methods and tools uh, were, were also discussed by that group, um, and there, there might need to be a charter or principles for how one selects the, uh, the assays that you might do. Okay. And then um, th this question that you, that you had raised about uh, uh, an agnostic platform versus science-driven questions, I think we're all scientists, we're all sort of attracted to the science-driven questions. And so can we choose a handful of grand challenges, uh, and they, they suggested a couple of them, uh, keeping in mind that when it comes to the omic assays, the, the genomics is relatively easy. You can measure a SNP with pretty darn good uh, accuracy. When it comes to measuring proteomic data that is highly variable, uh, that hasn't been validated across populations, other kinds of data that, uh, that have, you know, specifics for how the samples can be used. You know, DNA was designed billions of years ago to be an infra stable information uh, transfer system, uh, these other um, uh, proteins were, and other things were not. Um, so one of the things we could ask your group to, to define is how do you decide when an assay is ready to be applied to millions? You know, what criteria have to be met uh, to be able to, to do that? I don't think we, we heard that much. We also heard, I think, earlier in the, in the day or yesterday that it would be valuable to have large numbers of reference samples in key subgroups. I guess I would posit if we do these, sam you know, these assays across tens of millions of people, these cohorts will be those reference samples. So that may not be as much of an issue. Any edits to this one? Oh. I've inhibited you all, I'm sorry. Um, and then on the translation and clinical practice, uh, clinical impact, obviously the, the potential to advance practice um, and, and not only for general clinical medicine, but also sp some specific genetic opportunities, developing drugs, um, and then using it for uh, a variety of uh, generic uh, health literacy and health education um, uh, efforts, evidence generation, uh, and also getting into population health and policy. Uh, how do we actually do that handoff of, of knowledge to, to policy? Uh, the barriers that are, are well known um, but are still uh, challenging and need to be addressed. Again, I'm not going to, to read through those. I'm just going to go ahead if I don't hear any, any complaints. And then some exemplar uh, projects. Um, the, the suggestion was to standardize implementation of testing for familial hypercholesterolemia, for example, um, or hereditary breast ovarian cancer or Lynch syndrome uh, would be some, some easy, you know, low-hanging fruit that's agreed up upon by most uh, uh, groups is that these are important to be done. Um, also, some uh, developing some cohort or, or country-specific risk prediction models. Um, I was involved in Framingham when risk prediction models were first being developed. It's, it's not for the, you know, for the timid. I mean, it's a, it's a, a very in, intensive effort, uh, but something that would be well worth doing. 
and then providing continuously updated estimates of individual risk and, and health behaviors. We heard about that, that example in the Mexico City cohort that very rapidly was able to be uh, translated into improved health policy um, and the learning health care system and, and um, those based in hospitals that could be uh, very rapidly uh, implemented. And then the, the potential for integrating other personal information as well as clinical and biological information, uh, all of which can inform clinical care. Dan or others, did you want to make any changes? Francis. Just an observation that almost all of the things you have in this group are really scientific agendas, and all of the things you had in group three about scientific <laughs> agenda were sort of aimed at translation and clinical impact. It so you might say that these two groups really could be merged together just like you did with one and two. Would you guys, would you guys go with that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, Mark. Again, just there, there's a consistent deletion occurring. Uh, the bullet under exemplar projects, standardize the study of implementation. We will never standardize implementation. Sorry, sorry, so. sorry. I sh I've, I've been around you long enough. <laughs> I should know that. So, thank you. Some, any other place I left it off, Mark? <laughs> That's right, and I will. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, you're absolutely right. Impl implementation really is totally local. I'm learning this at Walter Reed. It's amazing how local it is. So, all right. Yes. You, your microphone isn't on, Dan. I was going to ask about the human knockout project. Hello. Yes. Yeah. One thought that wasn't captured perfectly, I, th I think, is the is the idea that we would look at. Uh, personal clinical biological information across ancestries and ask the question, are there differences in predictors of X, common disease, rare disease, uh, across ancestries? If there aren't, that's interesting. And if there are, that's even more interesting. So that's an op a scientific opportunity as well as an mm -hmm. implementation opportunity. Great. Okay. Other points on this one? All right, two more. You, you guys, you're doing well. So... So, compelling scientific questions addressable with millions of individuals. Now, several have come up as we've been talking, you know, so this isn't all of them, but at least there are some. So, uh, we, I think we all agreed that rare conditions, uh, uh, Jinming showed us about venomous snake bite, the small number of people in, in China Kaduri that died of that or, or of other things. So, so, rare conditions is a great place to start. Rare subgroups um, in, you know, very young uh, people who have an unusual condition or rare exposures, et cetera. Rare genotypes, the Human Knockout Project would be, um, you know, right Right, right up there with this. Plus, um, sakes, you know, just descriptions of people at extremes of risk. So those who are very genetically protected, who get disease, would be very interested, and pe people who are, are very genetically, you know, adverse, who don't get disease or who do, uh, would be worth studying. Consanguinity and founder population studies um, for, for collaborations. It's not clear that they are really that relevant in a population-based cohort you know, effort, uh, but something to keep in mind, at least. Um, we heard earlier uh, yesterday the critical bottlenecks should be identified because that can drive technology development that can then, um, you know, really be disruptive and Im improve uh, our ability to do these kinds of studies. Um, and pilot studies have been suggested, such as uh, utilizing a repository of electronic phenotyping algorithms. Um, there's one called the Phenotype Knowledge Base, but there are probably others. Uh, and test their transportability across multiple different countries uh, that speak different languages, have different healthcare systems, et cetera. Um, uh, applying national language pro natural language processing to cohort studies data collection forms to, to um, uh, harmonize them without the laborious, you know, everybody should ask the question in exactly the same way, could do the same thing with consents. Identifying high-risk individuals, as we heard, for early disease detection for the, for the cancer cohorts. And we also heard that that can be fraught with pitfalls um, when, when that early subclinical disease is actually influencing the outcome you're trying to measure. And sometimes you need to, you know, get rid of the first 10 years of, of follow-up, as we heard from, from Rory and the Million Women study, uh, trying to distinguish when those two cases are, are operative would be a very useful thing. Mark. It's the study of impl No, it's, I'm sorry. It's not the same study. <laughs> yeah. um, the consanguinity and found, founder population population studies um, is, is intriguing from a different perspective, and I think you're right in the way that you characterized it, but I think what we're finding as we begin to do um, familiarity analysis within large cohorts is that there's a lot more family structure that's hidden within those cohorts than we've previously identified. So I think if we were to modify that to include a standardized assessment of, of relatedness um, yeah. within cohorts, that could in fact be quite useful and might um, uh, develop some ideas about founder 
um, uh, genes, variants, whatever that uh, we haven't had previously. Great. And Walt? Yeah. Um, another class of uh, important questions are uh, around getting uh, more precise estimates of dose response relationships between exposures that are important, like, say, red meat and coronary heart disease. It, more sort of like was shown for blood pressure and mortality, that it's not just enough to know that higher red meat is related to more coronary heart disease, but really how much is a, a, a safe amount? Is there a safe amount? What are the, what is the magnitude of association? And you can say that about almost every aspect of diet and physical activity that we, we already know to be important, but still if we're serious about this, we really do want to have quantitative dose response relationships, mm -hmm. and that takes a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Great, Daniel? Um, I, I guess I just wanted to ask for clarification on the founder and consanguinous point. Um, and why, why they would be separated. It se seems to me that although obviously there are many cohorts that don't have high levels of consanguinity or founder populations, where it is possible to get cohorts that have large numbers and have those characteristics, those should be prioritized. I mean, Finland, other, other cohorts. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily put them in a separate bucket. Um, we'd see them as something, a, a, f a feature that could be prioritized. Mm -hmm. Great, good point. Added uh, benefit. Okay, great. Anything else on this one? All right, last slide, I think. No, maybe not. <laughs> I only have 20 more, so it's not a, not a problem. Uh, I think it is, let me just see. No, no, next to last. All right, so, um, so f needs, we, we identify, you know, almost anything that we're doing requires funding. Being here today required funding and required the, the uh, commitment of time from, from everybody who's here and others. Um, but obviously we, we have needs to support uh, registering uh, the, the cohorts themselves, providing metadata, depositing data, uh, reviewing c uh, country specific data access policies. It's not a small task um, and ensuring that we're complying with them when we use those data uh, also is, is something that will need a fair amount of support and is a heavy lift. Harmonizing consents, reconsenting uh, for either data use or data collection um, is a, a fairly costly uh, effort. Scalable phenotyping of outcomes. So there, there was the suggestion that we could uh, basically, you know, so kind of a funnel. I believe that was that was uh, your your suggestion, Rory, where you start with ascertainment, you get a big sort of a big group that you think are are having your disease of interest. Then you kind of scale down, look at them more intensively to you know confirm that they are, and then you look at them even more intensively to uh, characterize their subtypes and and other aspects of them. Collaborative analyses aren't aren't done for free, although they are done for free because everybody does them nights and weekends and other times, uh, and those need to be supported. Adding value to existing cohorts with cohort-wide assays and novel methods. Um, uh, the point was made yesterday that funders need to have patience and recognize that they're investing for the long term, uh, rather than pushing cohorts for um, uh, uh, quick publications or for you know coming up with something novel every time they come back in for um, uh, for funding. Whereas following up these cohorts is oftentimes the most the greatest value that we can provide. Uh, sequencing and genotyping support, particularly in under-resourced settings, uh, to help level the playing field. Where that will come from is challenging, uh, and we'll, we'll have to uh, try to address it. And then support for open source data platforms, analysis environments, data deposition, you know, hopefully some, some contribution from um, uh, cloud providers and that uh, that would be willing to help us with this. So I know that this, there's no way that this is all the funding needs that, that, uh, that y'all have identified. But are there some that are, are like really critical that we need to include on this list? It's 209. and I hope nobody plans to leave right at 215. Yes, John. Uh, so Terry, I'm not sure that I'm, anyone is in a position to say which is critical and which isn't, but the burden can be shared between funders by funders identifying particular needs that they are uh, concerned, particularly concerned with, oh, mm -hmm. and then working in collaboration so that more needs are met um, mm -hmm. by the funders pooling their resources strategically. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Uh, Roy. Um, I, get, <coughs> I guess in looking at that, the question is timeline. So, I mean, the genotyping at scale. Uh, it's come of age because it's so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. The idea that one's thinking now about sequencing, actually even in rich countries, let alone in low middle income countries, now uh, <coughs> at, at any scale I think is probably not is a, is premature. So I just, I just wonder whether 
it's the genotyping that one should be thinking about how one could, could do that across a lot of different settings uh, because you get an awful lot of bang for your buck. Uh, whereas sequencing, um, preferably we're five years away um, from it really being um, accessible. Uh, and, and it may well be that some of the other omic assays will be accessible mm -hmm. before sequencing uh, at very large scale. Mm. So oh. just kind of That's uh, a good point. thinking about timeline. Yeah, although the, the sequencing of small samples uh, of reference populations so that you can make your array is, is probably something we need to do. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay, great. <coughs> All right, uh, and we'll fix that later. All right, so possible outcomes from this meeting. Um, we, we think that the registry is a, a very uh, viable effort and something that could be done um, without, hopefully without torturing you too much to provide more information about your programs, uh, and that would help facilitate collaboration across the cohort. I think a, a question to ask, we, we at NIH tend to be very, you know, try to be very open with our, with our data and let anybody use it. Um, there are some groups that say basically you can play and see other people's data or other people's metadata or whatever only if you provide your own. Um, I think we would, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but um, would really try to encourage everyone to participate but make the information available to anyone who wants to use it. Is there any disagreement with that approach? Wow. All right. You guys are tired. Um, and then we, we need to, I think that's true. Then we need to come up with foundational principles for creating this consortium of cohorts or cohort of cohorts and agreement to, to further explore creating it. So is there anyone who, who doesn't want to at least explore um, the potential for developing a, a strong collaboration or, or consortium of cohorts uh, based on this meeting? Speak now. No, I'm, just, I'm just letting people know that they can. So, okay. Um, and then we'd, we'd like to identify some key work streams. I think that those basically are, are the breakout groups that we identified with the com combination of one and two and three and six, uh, which you guys don't remember the numbers, but I have them burned into my brain, so we will, we will make that work. Um, we need an organizational entity to support this. Uh, the, the G2MC, as I understand it, is, is quite interested in, in serving that function um, and needs to work very closely with the GA4GH. If you all are aware of another group that would like to do this, we would love to work with them. So. Um, and then there needs to be some outreach to cohorts that were not in attendance. We would do this primarily through our website, but potentially through uh, other news items, potentially um, um, you know, some kind of a, a press release or something about this meeting. We'd like to develop a white paper summarizing all the work that's, that's been done in these past uh, two days and hopefully publish it in a, in a high-profile journal. Uh, what we've typically done with these, and I hope it doesn't offend anyone, um, is to have basically the, the presenters and the moderators be the, the authors and then list all the participants um, in, you know, in a, a separate listing. Um, but that's, it's really about the only feasible way to get meaningful input from the people who have, have contributed the most in, in doing uh, these things. So we would try to, to do that within the next month or two, um, and we'll see how, how quickly we can get something out and get it uh, around. What we would like to do, though, is to share these slides and ask you within about a two-week time frame to, to comment back if there are things that, once you've gone away and thought about it, that you'd like to change. And then we would, would want to have some of the working groups continue and potentially have a second meeting um, like this one, perhaps, has been suggested in, in China or in other places, um, that, uh, if, if that would be feasible. Other things that we want to have is follow up. Because if not, I think. Just can I come over and present my 12 slides? Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if not, Jeff is going to present his 12 slides. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> so, Mark, please. Terry, there probably is one other thing that could be added to this, which is touched on, but not necessarily explicitly mentioned. Uh, an endeavor of this scale has the opportunity to act as an accelerant. So, to pick up on Sorori's point, an accelerant to price point four because you're at scale that commands that uh, purchase power, an accelerant to new technologies, all too often technologies are launched before they're fully optimized. But the most important accelerant, which is touched on in several of the slides but not necessarily explicitly meant, uh, mentioned, is that this type of scale with this endeavor, with these people, can be a massive accelerant to health gain. And that what we should be thinking about is when we've wo op worked out the gaps we should think of the opportunities to plug those gaps with future cohorts that don't yet mm. exist. So to imagine the things that haven't yet been imagined. Great. Great. All right. I think we're done.
Francis. It's all yours. So, thank you. Well, in the next hour, Jeremy and I thought we would <laughs> summarize the summary because that seemed to be what the agenda suggested our role would be, but no, fear not. Uh, I think we've already heard a really remarkable, comprehensive summary. In fact, it's a little overwhelming when you consider all of the things that just appeared on the screen that we are going to fold into this consortium of cohorts. But let's aim high. This is a good thing. I do think this has been a historic gathering. I think we've started something here. So you should all give yourselves a hand, all right? And it's obviously going to be a vast amount of work uh, to move this forward from the day and a half discussion into actual actions. And I appreciate very much the G2MC and GA4GH volunteering sort of to be a sort of co-secretariat of the enterprise going forward. You heard they're going to be working groups. Um, it sounds like there are going to be about four. And I hope that everybody in this room uh, and those who've already escaped, who are particularly vulnerable to be asked to help, <laughs> Uh, will be willing uh, to continue this momentum. And, and let's not let a long time pass before we make sure that we build on this uh, to see where we can take that. Everybody's worried about funding, and everybody thinks that J Jeremy and I are the uh, ATMs that are just going to uh, <laughs> receive your card and belch forth all sorts of funds. Let me just say, NIH is incredibly interested in seeing this succeed, and we will do what we can to support some infrastructure to help it get going. So certainly in terms of what is going to be contemplated as far as building a registry of some sort, we will entertain uh, requests uh, from G2MC and GA4GH about what that might take and try to be as flexible as we can. But let's think about this going forward. I think probably the models that were used for the Genome Project or for HapMap or for 1,000 Genomes or currently for the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease are pretty good ones to look at, and that is where all the countries who are engaged basically have a funding source, and those funders are then encouraged to make it possible for their contributions to be full participants in what's going on. And so, again, all of you in the room who have funding agencies that are supporting what you've done already, I hope you'll sort of feed back the expectation that that's going to be the model. I don't think there's going to be some massive pool of funds that will suddenly become available. Now, having said that, I recognize there are going to be special instances where we probably do want to look at a possible pool of funds for grand challenges, for instance, that people might want to compete for, and particularly for low- and middle-income countries that have special populations where we really do want to be able to include that effort as vigorously as possible. I don't know how we'll work that out, but we should think about philanthropies, for instance, as potential contributors to that space, and you can think of a few, and I can too. This seems to me, of all the things that people are out there wanting to devote funds to as far as medical research that's going to make the world healthier, this is a pretty compelling story here. So there may be an opportunity to do some of that kind of fundraising, and that may also include industry that could have some pretty significant interest in seeing this succeed as well. So I have to think about all that. But again, I hope the, uh, the actual next step for all of you in terms of where you are right now is to let your funders know that there's something exciting happening here. But if we're going to be as good at it as we hope to be, that's going to mean a real <laughs> synergy between all the funding sources to make that happen. Um, finally, I do think that from my perspective, moving this uh, forward in a fashion that gets us all back together again uh, pretty soon, I guess we've talked about a year from now, but that's kind of a long time. So we might want to think about even doing something sooner than that with the momentum that we need to get established here. And so that might mean something in the fall as opposed to next spring. And I like the idea of having that kind of gathering move around a bit in the world. And uh, maybe China would be an interesting place uh, for the next gathering. We've already had a nice offer there uh, for hosting, uh, which would be, I think, a, a great signal uh, to the world that we really are serious about this being a full international collaborative effort. But if we do this right, it's going to make a huge difference in terms of what we well, all I think are here dreaming about is coming up with answers about how we keep people healthy and how we manage chronic illness when it happens and how we learn about what's happening with human biology and human medicine. So congratulations to all of you for having gotten us this far, and uh, let's roll our sleeves up and keep it going. Jeremy.
So, thanks very much, Francis. Just a, a few comments at the end. There were a few comments during the last day and a half which really struck for me. One was, I think it was attributed to you, John, why on earth do epidemiologists work with geneticists? And the answer was funding, which I thought was, <laughs> was a brutal honesty. But <laughs> And the second one was from Camilla, and, and I think it goes back to Francis's his point there. Um, I think it's fair to say NIH and Wellcome Trust are committed to working through this in some ways, shape or form. Um, but as an ATM machine, we are not exclusive. And uh, there is a responsibility, as Camilla, I think, very beautifully said, for governments to step up and appreciate that these are infrastructure building projects, which ultimately will both advance science, but will also improve public health and public policy beyond it. And, and therefore, I'm sure I speak for Francis and certainly for the Wellcome Trust as well, and I suspect for the MRC, that we would certainly welcome more members of this ATM machine uh, as we take this forward, because uh, despite the scale of the NIH and the much smaller scale of the Wellcome Trust, we can't do this alone. So we do not want to do this just as a duo, but, but um, we welcome all of you. Um, the third was that I think this is for the long term. Um, and when you get started on these, I think you have to at least in my language, emotionally and viscerally commit to it for the long term. Now, of course, you'll look at it every so often. Every five years seems like a reasonable number. But, but I think when you get started, you've got to realize you're in this for the long term and take that on board. The tributes to Richard, I think, were well deserved. And Richard, thanks for joining us. The dinner was very special. Thank you for organizing that. And uh, Richard, you've had an influence on everybody in this room and many, many thousands beyond it. Thank you. I did just want to very briefly address the issue, which I think is a little bit of attention in the room, which perhaps got a little bit of glossed over, and, and that is everybody in this room, and some certainly beyond it, are welcome into this consortium. There will be sort of larger cohorts, not necessarily defined by N, but larger in other ways. There'll be cohorts which do, and I think I would pick out perhaps Biobank that does this, that is there as a true global resource, and I suspect what Francis is planning here in the US will be similar. There will be others which are more nimble, more flexible, addressing specific issues, but at the sort of scale that we've put out on 100,000. There is no need to think this is one or the other. In this sort of consortium, for it to go forward, all of those have a space. They may well address slightly different issues. They may take slightly different approaches. But I would caution against trying to impose a single unified system on everybody. Monolithic structures tend not to work. Working together to work what does work, share best practices, not repeating the mistakes and reinventing wheels, makes enormous sense. Finding mechanisms to share information, samples, and data in a safe way, which recognizes all of the different ambitions of people involved, and Richard made this point on a number of occasions, I think we do have to work through that, and it's not just this community which is struggling with that, many other communities are struggling with that as well. So if we could try and address that issue and see this consortium as something that leads a better way of finding a mechanism for sharing information, sharing samples, sharing data in ways that incentivizes the right behaviors and disincentivizing the bad behaviors, then if it just achieved that, it would have achieved a huge amount. So I think there is space for everybody who is here. And, and if you know of cohorts that are not here, we would very much welcome them coming on board. The other power of coming together like this is if you do have in your own countries or beyond your own countries, if you have the power of this community behind you, you may well be able to influence your governments in ways that you as a single voice may not be able to do. You may be able to influence the prices you get when you're negotiating with companies. There's all sorts of things that by working in partnership and bringing best practices of what worked in another country and using that within the government or the funding agencies in your own country may bring you additional benefits that would allow you to benefit from being part of this consortium. And I think that's probably true of all of us. That's the added value of being together. And finally, I'd like to just thank, uh, again, as always, our hosts, Jeff, Terry, thank you very much, and please pass everybody's thanks on to Duke University for hosting us. Um, it always amazes me when I come to the US just how phenomenally big your food portions are. <laughs>
but thank you. There'll be no need to eat for a week or two after last night, but it was a delightful dinner. Thank you very much. And as always coming to the US, the generosity and the warmth of welcome here is, is unparalleled. And thank you very much to everybody that's hosted all of us here. We look forward to seeing everybody, we hope, in Beijing next time. Um, but please keep in touch through Terry and Jeff. In the meantime, you've got their emails. Thank you very much. Thank you.